Welcome everyone to uh, the January pick for the LUH Book Club. Uh, this month was my pick. I picked this book here, What You Are Looking For Is In The Library by Michiko Aoyama, um, a Japanese author. Um, it's been translated into English um, in a lot of countries apparently. It's an award-winning book. Um, so yeah, let's get started. Um, general impressions first. Um, let's go with, let's go with Mel. She looks prepared. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, this book is right up my alley. Not surprisingly, not only did I just generally enjoy the story, but the nostalgia element of being in what felt like just like very familiar Japan from when I lived there really made it, for, um, like not uh, the kicked it up a notch for me in terms of enjoyment. So yeah, I was like five stars, no problems. I want more, please. And I was very disappointed to discover that there's no more works translated by this author. She's done heaps. No more of them have been translated. Very cranky about that, but otherwise very happy. <laughs> yeah, so I'm hoping the success of this book might mean that some more might get translated. Please. Um... <laughs> Let's go with, I'm going to mix it up and not go in order, just to confuse myself, uh, <laughs> Kirsten. <laughs> it's funny because I'm next to Mel on my screen. <laughs> <laughs> You're right in the middle of mine. Um, I really liked it too. I think like Mel, I, this is this is um, very up my alley. Um, I really loved the tone of it. I really loved that it was like lots of little like vignettes um, rather than one main story, but I loved how they all kind of subtly in interconnected. Um, especially towards the end, um, and it was just it just made me happy, and it was um, I it kept reminding me of something, but I could never put my finger on it, like just the feeling that I got from it. But I, I hope hopefully someone will say, "Hey, it kind of reminded me of this," and I'll go, "That's what it was." But <laughs> it just had this sort of almost like a nostalgic kind of feeling, even though I'm, it, not for any time or place or anything, but just for that that feeling. I don't know; it's hard to explain, but I really enjoyed it. Uh, you know what, I should have gone first, but so I might go next. Um, I really enjoyed it. I really liked the, uh, um, I did relate to a few things, you know, that sort of feeling that everyone was sort of stuck in a rut uh, in some way or stuck in a change of life that they didn't know how to navigate. Um, I really enjoyed that. Each of the stories seemed quite different as well. Um, so I really enjoyed being able to see this. I thought, I think she did a pretty good job of um, changing up the stories and making them from different perspectives and I did like where she she mixed the um characters from earlier stories in but just very subtly they weren't like really um central to anybody else's story so it could have been anyone but it was just nice to see those those characters recurring a little bit um just go oh that's that's that person from that one um yeah so yeah I did enjoy it it just lifts you up a little bit um Elizabeth yeah um I it was it was an okay read for me. Um I was a little bit bored at first. Um and I don't think I kind of felt like that the first story didn't kind of put it off on the best foot. Um although I can kind of understand why it was done that way. Um but you know, I settled into it and it was like a uh a nice and undemanding read which uh it was probably good for for this time of year um so I don't think I would like seek out more necessarily but uh um it wasn't like it wasn't a terrible reading experience or anything just it was nice <laughs> Bobby um so yeah uh I I enjoyed it I I don't know that I'm going to rush out and get more that are like this I know I know when uh, morning tea um we were talking about it and some people were like i'm gonna go and get more and there's a whole genre this is exciting um <laughs> however you, that was me <laughs> that was me <laughs> um it, like, it, um, it was a it was a nice read to have for this time of year i do agree because it wasn't super demanding because because they were short it like it wasn't a marathon read one of our yeah so um so i could sort of dip in and out um i did the audiobook big surprise so um they had different narrators for each audio book or sorry for each um vignette excuse me um which on the one hand I kind of liked but at the same time um 
what one of the narrators sort of graded on me a little bit and it didn't help because it was it was the it was the it was the final vignette and I was already like as that one was sort of unfolding I was like I don't know if I'm gonna make it through this one and the the voice I didn't like either so it didn't help but I did make it through it and I'm happy that it it kind of did a it turned upward at the end um which was nice um I have before the coffee gets cold and I never got around to reading it so I mean I think at least this probably kicked my butt a little bit into reading that one um because I know that's sort of in the same genre but yeah so I'm actually this is kind of for me this was one of those if book club hadn't picked it I wouldn't have picked it up but I'm glad that I got to try it out and got to see something a little different so yeah thank you Kim for picking it no worries uh Lisa yeah, I think the word I, I would use, I think you said lifted up and I'm like, yeah, uplifting is how I found it. Um, I, uh, I, I, I haven't quite finished the fifth story, uh, but I feel like that I, I don't even feel like a spoiler would be a spoiler. It's, it's it was just some really lovely, sweet stories. Um, I could talk a little bit about uh, a couple of the characters that I definitely want to explore with the hangout um but um come back to that um and um yeah it was it's it's been a light read um I like the structure of it too like the the each each individual story and the different perspectives I thought that was done really well like um because you have got quite different voices um from people in very different life experiences and ages so I, I did actually I thought that was done fairly well yeah Hmm. Uh, Sheik? Yeah, it's a bit of a mixed bag. Um, I thought it was really uplifting and positive after I got through the first story, um, which was honestly a pretty hard. Um, like, I did enjoy I did enjoy it, and I'm glad I read it, but I didn't end up finishing it, and I'm not even sure. I'm, at, I'm somewhere into the last story, and I'm not even sure I can get through it. Um, after the first after the first few i'm like wow this is actually you know this started off pretty rough and but they're really starting to call it together but after the fourth i'm just like okay this is really starting to drag out um so um i don't think i'd go back and listen to it again um it's um but it was a positive thing overall um just not my particular type of thing at the moment so yeah all right Naomi. I really enjoyed it too. Um, I like the little short stories and how they were all joined together. Um, it was nice that it was just really easy to listen to. I did the audiobook and really enjoyed all the different voice actors that did the different people. Um, so yeah, it was really good. I enjoyed it. Lovely. And Alyssa, lucky last. Yeah, um, I did enjoy it. I um, I liked the uh, pictures actually. They uh, fit in well um yeah it was interesting that they were slightly interconnected but not really all one novel but more like five little uh short stories um and I definitely like the the fact that it was Japanese and not western you know just get getting a little bit more sense of different cultural um you know mores like everybody's just a lot more polite <laughs> for one and a bit more subdued and you know some of their struggles would be like well that wouldn't happen to us because we would just you know speak up or you know move on more quickly or you know yeah it was interesting I liked it um Sorry, that sounded weird. Anyway, um, maybe we should talk about the first one because a lot of people did like the first one as much and we can go in order, so that sounds good to me. Can, before um, we go in and yeah. talk about them, did everybody know they were short stories? Because honestly, I kind of got a shock when the first one ended. Yeah. <laughs> I, sort of, like, I sort of flipped a little <laughs> bit beforehand because having the physical book, you could sort of flip. Um, I kind of got that it might be. Um, I wasn't a hundred, like when I read it, I wasn't a hundred percent sure it was separate stories, but when I started, I wasn't surprised because of the, like I read the flap in the side and everything and it sounded like it was different little stories. Um, mm. so yeah, yeah. I wasn't I, expecting it to be different stories either. 
but I wasn't, I, it didn't sort of bother me. Did it mm. bother you, Mel? Or was it it like- bothered me a little bit only because I actually did enjoy the first story. And so when it ended, I was sort of like, oh, what's going on? <laughs> yeah. And I sort of, I felt ripped out of it and then chucked into a new one. And I was like, ah, oh, I, I was, in, I was happy over there. <laughs> I, I got over it. It was fine. It was just sort of that initial sort of feeling. Yeah, no, I, I think I got the realize. from flipping through. I sort of got the gist that it was because there's only like five chapters, so <laughs> that kind of goes. Oh, they're probably individual stories in each chapter if there's only five, because otherwise they're very long chapters. Mm. <laughs> Alyssa, you were saying something. Yeah, I'm. I'm with you, Mel. I didn't really realize until chapter three that no, we're not going back to the first one. No, they're not that interconnected. Mm. Yeah. I'm yeah. Surprised. Well, but I was very pleased when the interconnectedness started to happen and I was like, oh, oh thank goodness. Because the second story you really don't realise for quite a long time and it was only when the same librarian showed up and, and everything that I was like, oh, we're in the same area. These are connected in some ways. These are not entirely. Yeah, I figured when when they, she went and when they went into the library like it started and they went into the library, I'm thinking, hmm, maybe the library is the the um yeah. the thing that's all connected. Mm. Yeah. I, I think oh, and reason... also when it says here, it says in Kamachi's unique book recommendations. So as soon as Kamachi's name came up, I'm like, I think Kamachi must be the one that's in the center of it all because it mentions that in the little blurb at the front cover. Read the blurb. Yeah, I, <laughs> I usually don't. I usually just go, well, especially if it's other people's picks, I don't read it, read the blurb. Usually I might skim it. But yeah, I think because I picked this up physically and was looking at it before yeah. I bought it and didn't know anything about it because the first thing I did was pick up a physical copy. Um, yeah, I think I actually read the blurb because I was standing there in the shop and I'm like, do I want to purchase this right now or not? <laughs> Let's have a look. Yeah. I did the audio, so I didn't have the heads up from the blurb. Yeah. And I did the audio because, ironically, what I was looking for was not in the library because I mean, <laughs> there are not many copies in the library. It was in the library, but I was it, I had it on hold for more than a month and it never turned up. And I was like, right, I, I'm not going to have time to read this. I'm just going to have to jump over to audio. So I gave up. But yeah, so I didn't actually read any blur. I didn't even read like the Goodreads synopsis or anything. I was just like, oh yeah, this is the book club pick, and I started listening to it. Yeah. So yeah. it came as a surprise to me. How did you find the audio book, Kirsten? If you don't mind me asking, um, I found some of the narrators better than others, but in general, I quite enjoyed it. Like I didn't have too many problems with it. Um, yeah, I agree. The last narrator was harder to listen to, but um yeah it's I quite enjoyed it it was pretty good so for audiobook readers you you don't know that there's a really great uh, like picture in every yeah, and it's yeah a really good summary yes. it's like this is the first yeah. one she's really falling apart you could tell she's a quite a mess yeah, you know, quite detailed with such... like the bin overflowing with things. You could see what's overflowing from the yeah. bin. I did, um, because I knew a few of the That's people similar. were doing audiobook. I did just before this post probably was... very bad pictures of them. Oh, they're pretty good. I was just cooking yeah. dinner and I didn't get a chance to look yeah. at them. Yet. And also I, I posted earlier the list of books that it's um in the back where it says every book that's mentioned in here. So all her recommendations and all the um, manga that the second to last chapter is referencing that they're talking about is all written in the back of the book. Except the fictional yeah. book that doesn't actually exist. Oh, don't even get me started. I've been down that road so hard. <laughs> I know, hard. I want that one. <laughs> I, want, I want the pink plane tree. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> which, which fictional book was that? The, in the third story, the lady who is the female um, editor, she mm -hmm. had helped publish a book. Yeah. Oh, right. That right. book does not actually exist. All the my, all the other books exist. Yeah. That one does not. <laughs> Which it makes sense. I yeah. totally understand. Because <laughs> then you'd have to write, one a, I want to write a fake story, <laughs> or either you'd have to write a true story. You'd have to fa write a fake story about a real book, which wouldn't have worked. <laughs> and I don't only think a true story would be that good. <laughs> only Rainbow Rowell apparently does this, where she writes nope. a book that has a book inside of it and then goes and actually writes the book. <laughs> she's done that with, the most recent, with her most recent world that she's done. She's She went and she set up another pseudonym and she's been writing all of the fairy tales that get referenced in this new universe that she's writing. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> That's dedication to you. We'll see you later, guys. Bye, David. Right, see you later. Bye, David. 
Um, Flanagan did that as well. He has some books by the fake author Kilgore Trout, and then he's mm -hmm. gone and written some Kilgore Trout books. Okay, so there are yes, a few. I, I have heard oh, that. Yeah. 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 I remember hearing that Kilgore Trout name. <laughs> <laughs> Before we get into like the like bits of the book too much more, I just have I, I have a little pet peeve. It's something I've noticed in this genre. There's always a cat on the cover, and the cat never makes an appearance, and it makes me very sad. <laughs> this particular cat, especially but, because I think it was a tabby. Uh, like the, when the, the cats that actually do appear is only like two cats briefly. One's yeah. a tabby, and one's I can't remember. Yeah, it orange um, or white or something. <laughs> It took me because I after I read this one, I went and I checked about like before the coffee gets cold and stuff because that has a kitty on it as well. And I'm, and they're like, no, it, this is just part of it's like that whole cozy mystery thing. Cozy yeah. mystery books have a certain type of cover art. It's a thing with this genre. And I was like, Bleh. yeah, <laughs> looking out a window with a stack of books, a coffee, a plant, and a cat. That's just yeah. cozy. <laughs> it is cozy, but you know what's also cozy? Having the cat making cat it cute. It's a library. <laughs> I, I don't know. I think the librarian is magic. I, I think she's Totoro, in fact. Yeah. Some Japanese <laughs> god. So she might be a cat in a different persona. Right. I'm glad you it said feels that. like there's cats in all these books that I'm showing you and none of them actually have cats in them. <laughs> Look, I haven't read all of these, so I don't know no, if don't they know have yet. cats in them. It's just that they do have all cats on all, every single one of them. That, that needs to be a website where you can look up a book and check whether the cat on the cover is in the book so we know beforehand. <laughs> it's quite like the Does the Dog Die website. I was um, reading something about... um. A book um turns out i'm not gonna read it, it sounds really bad but everyone in the or i was reading the goodreads reviews and people are like just at the start because everyone's gonna want to know this the dog doesn't die <laughs> and we're like, everyone's like oh good i'll read it now because no one wants <laughs> there's all these people going oh yeah i wasn't gonna read it until i knew yeah there's an actual website you can go it's called does the dog die dot yeah. com and it will tell you for your book like all the different triggers yeah and movies i think too it does which one i think it also covers movies yes it does yep Good, because Jonesy in the original Alien movie, that was the thing that distressed me the most, whether Jonesy was going to survive or not, the cat. Yeah. Like, <laughs> uh, for those who don't know, not much of a spoiler, he does. <laughs> Good. I feel like it's past the age, uh, the uh, the date of um, spoiler-free. Yep. <laughs> the alien movie. I'm not sure I agree with that. I don't feel like there's a statute of limitations and spoilers. Come on. <laughs> you like never know when people are gonna media. access media. And you know, <laughs> new people are born all the time, so <laughs> I'm pretty sure all of us have, though. So <laughs> I don't need, to put it, a, need to put I a warning at the start of this video if you don't want to know about a cat I don't think in. Alien is is a movie for Mel on any level. No, no. I've <laughs> seen no, the second no. one. I haven't seen the first one. I, I'm not watching Alien. Nobody can pay no. me ah, maybe to no. watch Alien. <laughs> <laughs> and we do not recommend it for you, Mel. No. <laughs> I didn't have a choice in the matter. <laughs> it's like you have to watch this movie. Oh, oh dear. Okay, let's okay. do stories now. <laughs> All right. yeah, sorry, went down the rabbit hole. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like we're getting off topic. How off topic are we gonna get? Um, no, he was saying something. Sorry, oh, it's fine. Don't worry about it. You sure? It's fine. Don't worry about it. Okay, go for it, Kim. <laughs> um. So, first story is about. I've got to remember um, the the um character names. Tomoka Fujiki. Yep, yep, yep. So the real uh, retail assistant. Yes. Um. Yep. Who doesn't really like her job? <laughs> yeah. Um. It was such the her the change in mentality she had. Yeah. After the other um retail assistant helped her out was yeah. so very Japanese. It was just intense. <laughs> <laughs> The, the taking pride in your yes. work, no matter what your work is, and that there is value in it, no matter what the work is, is just mm -hmm. mm, so Japanese. <laughs> Although I think that could do, if with some Western people could really embody that a little bit more, because it doesn't matter what your job is, you're probably helping someone. And yeah, even if you don't feel, I think it, it helps people to realise that they are, because some mm -hmm. jobs can seem so menial and so pointless. Mm -hmm. um, that I think people get 
you know, that depresses people when they don't think they're doing something um, that matters. Yeah. Um, but everything really does matter. Otherwise, the job wouldn't be there. So even if it's a crappy job, you're probably, you know, you should have pride in it. Um, so I think that was, yeah, that did strike me as very Japanese from what I know. And it was nice to see her do that sort of turn around from being like, oh, this is, I'm not doing anything positive and things like that to like, well, I, it, it may not be the best job in the world, but I should do it as best as I can. I really mm -hmm. liked that. Um, and I really liked the um, children's book in this. It's very cute. I kind of want to read this children's book um, about the, is it mice? Mice making Castella? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, um, hers was a very simple, uh, compared to the others, hers was a very simple story where um, all she really did was just, it wasn't a big life change, but it was a, more of a change of mindset for her. Um, I feel like it was. Well, it a was lot of them were, but it, I think it was a, because yeah, it was. to me, it was more. It to me, it was less about the job. Although obviously, it was good that it was not only taking pride in what you're doing now, but also that that you can be aiming to do more and something yeah. different if you want to. Yeah. Um, but I, I, to me, I really identified with the whole. Ah. Your first, you're out on your own, and you're not really doing everything right the way you're supposed to. And um, like, so you're not cooking, you're not really cleaning, you're not doing all of the bits and pieces. And that that mind switch for her, I really identified with that, and I actually think that was a very big thing because yeah. that is a huge step for you when you if you're out on your own at first that you start to actually realize, oh, all those things that I've been that my parents used to nag me about, I'm supposed to be doing them now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, and also even if it's not like necessarily. Whether whether or not the size of the change is is kind of irrelevant because this is the story that's setting the template for the rest of them. Yes. Yeah. So it was a, a sort of a, a very um easy one to to, but I think the others impacted me more. But I guess this was a yeah you're right it is a good jumping off point because it wasn't too complicated as well. Um and I think a lot of people could relate to being young. So <laughs> it's probably um yeah it would be a better story to start with than um. So the one at the end, which was the oldest person, mm -hmm. I'm kind of wondering if it went in. No, it didn't go in age. No, range. it didn't go in. Age. Oh, <laughs> yeah, I, I wondered that as well, but it didn't. And the oldest person last. So yeah. yeah, that was quite interesting. So yeah, it's probably good that you have the youngest person first because most people could probably relate to the youngest person at some it's point. It's also in their sort of exactly where you would expect that to happen. Whereas like in the later ones, it was a little bit different in terms of how it happened because of their age and what happened and that, whereas this one follows a fairly typical sort of mm. story, sort of basic idea of it all, I think. Yeah. Um, I was wondering if we're talking about how the different characters were in a particular sequence, um, if people wanted to comment on uh, how the different age interactions, like the characters intertwine, uh, a little bit. I, I don't know if that was something that um, that anyone was trying to say earlier um, <clears throat> because I wondered whether those dynamics were more Japanese, um, some of those interactions that Which felt very Japanese. What, what are you thinking about there in terms of whose interactions? Uh, the subtle intertwining of the characters. Um, uh, I think um, might have been where um, Naomi was trying to speak up about that too. Um, the um, the the way that those intertwinings happened, uh, like the the like make statements of respect about that person or the way that it, this person would ref, would speak about that person felt much more Japanese than than Western. I'm trying to think of a concrete example. <laughs> I I found it in terms of how they actually chose to name people because they were obviously not using the titles that would be used in Japanese, but I found it really fascinating the way they used different um, English titling to sort of and I was like oh I know what they're what they're actually trying to use from Japanese there like when um, Natsumi the um, publishing lady was talking to. Um, uh, Madame Mizue, um, I was like, oh, she calls her sensei. I can tell. <laughs> and, okay. and like, because they, no, Madame wasn't used for anybody else, right? It was the only person that Madame was used for. Yes. And sensei is very commonly used there um, as not just a sign of respect of 
age but rather as a sign of respect of knowledge and skills yeah. and yep. so very much like that's what she's doing in terms of a referencing there I was like ah I know exactly what she's saying there <laughs> yes <'cause laughs> other I think in that story others refer to her not as the same refer to her differently said her name yeah. differently yeah well it also depends on if you're talking directly to the person in yeah. Japanese versus if you're talking about them yeah. um it's a little bit different in terms of how they would reference them under those circumstances so so I noticed that if that's the kind of thing you're talking about, Lisa. Has anyone actually had Castella? I've never had Castella. Yes. <laughs> yes. I don't think it's good. But I, it was, it's just a basic cake. It's, it's fine. It's, cake, yeah. <laughs> honestly, the closest thing I would li um, liken it to is Madeira. Okay. Um, if it's if it's a non-liquid Madeira, which most Madeiras in Australia are. <laughs> so... <laughs> If you have like a, if you go down to Coles and buy yourself a plain Madeira no icing, you've got basically a Castella because it's basically a butter cake. Oh, okay, cool. I was wondering, <laughs> is it meant to be dipped in alcohol like Madeira cake? Because I believe that was what the original purpose of Madeira cake was. You would yeah, eat people cake. assume that it's made with Madeira, but actually that's not how you're supposed to use it. But because of that association, people have started putting Madeira in it, so it's like. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, no, uh, yeah, it, it's not, as far as I'm aware, it's not traditionally done that way. It sounds to me like it's the kind of cake that's been um, adopted from somewhere in Europe. I'm guessing probably Spain. Spain. <laughs> um, and um, so what the Japanese did with it versus what the Spanish did, did with it might be very different um, because the other problem you get with um, a lot of Japanese words that are not actually Japanese, i.e. Castella, um, they might reference something that's in the real world but it doesn't mean it's the same as that thing actually was. It might be in some way influenced by it. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah, it's it's a bit of a, a tricky sort of thing. I would guess in terms of as the Japanese version, no, not dipped in alcohol. It would have been just eaten plain. Yeah. And you can pretty much find it in, um, in any 7-Eleven slash corner store in Japan. It's, it's It'll be wrapped up in plastic, but it'll be there. Yeah, I can't think of much else to talk about in the first one. It was actually my favourite. Like everybody's sort of yeah. saying it was kind of boring or I, I didn't enjoy it. I'm like, oh, my God, it was my favourite. It's not that I didn't enjoy it or thought it was boring. I just, like, if I had to rank them, it would be near the bottom because I enjoyed some of them a lot. So, <laughs> but I did enjoy all of them, honestly. Uh, you like that one the most, yep. Um, um, it, it, it's a hard one between that one and number three but it is definitely right up there for me number three is the one with the the, the, the editor the editor oh yeah. oh never mind okay i got them backwards no i was thinking number three was the the guy who wanted the antique shop and like I think I, naomi was two, gonna say something two. just then about it's about number one or i was just gonna say that i actually really enjoyed number one mm -hmm. i liked watching this young girl work out her place and how she wants to work in the world and how she is going to become an adult. Like, I feel like she was very in between, you know, getting ramen and fast food and just store like food from the grocery, like pre made food from the grocery store and sort of like coming into being an adult and learning to cook mm. for herself. And just it was really nice to see someone who was in the adult world but still didn't feel like an adult and was trying to learn how to become an adult. Yes. I also found it very satisfying, that one. Um, the Some of them didn't have as most, the, like, the most satisfying ending, which was absolutely fine. I did not need all of them to have, like, a perfect resolution <laughs> by any means, but I did find this one particularly satisfying as well in terms of how it ended up. Maybe I found oh. this one the least relatable because I didn't move out of home till 30. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I actually did quite like the first one too. I didn't say that, um, but I quite liked it too and also could very much relate to it. <laughs> oh, I was just picturing literally my life because when I moved out of home, I moved to Japan. 
So I was doing all the things that she's actually talking about. I had an apartment by myself. I was learning how to take care of everything. I was mostly buying things from the corner store to eat. Like it, it was my life, literally. <laughs> Very nostalgic then. Yes. I cannot emphasize that hard enough. <laughs> I was thinking that might be why you relate. It's so hard to this one. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, all of them, like, felt very comfortable. Like, I love this being in modern Japan type stuff um, because so much of what I read from Japan is not set in modern slash real world settings. So this was really nice from that respect. But, yeah, the first one hit me like that with the nostalgia. <laughs> Did you also feel like what, because um, I, I, I know with me as well that whole what, what Naomi was saying, like the, yeah, there was definitely a period of my life where I was like, I'm in the adult world. I'm not really there yet. <laughs> yes, it was all yeah. of those feelings because, yeah, like uh, just as an anecdote, as an example, um, I can remember being in my first apartment in Japan and I was all set up and I'd been there for a while, but I was still, when I was getting the washing off the line, I was actually taking it off the line, but then it would just go on the couch <laughs> and that's as far as it would go. <laughs> So I was at this exact level of, you know, adulting. <laughs> so when it's I was not even, sorry. No, go ahead. You finish first. You oh, finish. it was not even like my closet was very far away. It was right next to the couch. <laughs> <laughs> this was a Japanese apartment. Things were not far away. <laughs> sorry, just to no. embarrassment. <laughs> <laughs> It was a long time ago, people. It was more than 20 years now. <laughs> no judgment. <laughs> no judgment. I have laundry on the couch right now. Actually, <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? It's everyone else's laundry. That's not mine. I put mine away. <laughs> and I do feel like even though most of us have, have moved through that stage, there are still times where we all feel like we're not really adults or have there are stuff that we haven't learned. I'm we really glad no one can see my falls right now. Let's just say that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure I'm going to be 90 years old, shuffling around, think, feel, still feeling like a kid in some way, honestly. <laughs> I'll be right back, guys, but keep talking. Yeah. Yep. Um, so it, I found it interesting that it almost seemed to be the rice balls being this magical thing. Like the library is one thing and she's, She's kind of the, um, I don't know how to pronounce it, Dukes at Mach Machina, like the nice. god in the works that is creating things for people. But they also have inputs from other people in their lives. It's not just her mm. pulling the strings. Like in the first one, she she has a friend at work or a friend connected with work who gives her rice balls. And it's the easiest thing for her to say, Oh wow! Some you know something that's not that hard, and it's just so nourishing. And she kind of gets that nourishment and moves on from there. And the rice balls make a later appearance as well, which is interesting and cute. Yes, and that was very cute. Yeah, that was very cute. Because I think one yeah. of them, and because he talks to her at the thing, and um, it, uh, the old man at the end is talking to to her, and yeah she's like oh rice balls are you know says something about rice balls he's like did a man did a man a boyfriend or something make rice balls for you she's like yeah. blushing oh hello song <laughs> yep the uh, another cat makes an appearance yes <laughs> <laughs> what the what the book lacks in cats our our um, book club makes up for <laughs> we try anyway yeah <laughs> I did find a number of cats mentioned in chapter two. Yes. <laughs> there's a cat cafe, as I recall. Yes. Oh, yeah, there's a cat cafe. Yep. Um, sorry, mm -hmm. can I just go back for a second to the librarian? Yep. Yep. I actually think that the book is sort of misdirecting you with the title to try and ascribe far too much relevance to the librarian yep. in terms of what she's doing. Yep. The people who are coming to see her are already open by the fact of being there and asking questions. And there, like someone said, there are other influences that are involved in all of it. It's the impetus point, I suppose you could say almost, but it's not, is that the right word for it? Impetus. I don't know. Impetus. <laughs> um, you know, it's that spark. It, it, it sort of gets them to change their thoughts or, but 
they <laughs> the librarian in no way shape or form in my mind actually thought that these things were necessarily going to be making the impact that actually ended up happening well, it was she's... more of a, yeah. a a giving something that might you know be of interest to them to to be something different they saw in it what they needed to see in it uh i think that's iffy i mean she even says that the little doodads are the felt things are random but she suggested all the books and i i think she's a god i mean she's <laughs> she's she's a japanese demon thing like she's huge <laughs> and she's pal like everybody's just taken by her her physical her physicality they're just shocked um but her kindness and you know, and then she turns off kind of like a robot. She's she's there's something weird going on there, and I don't know enough about Japanese, you know, demons or supernatural to know what that is all about. I mean, it could be less that she's a god and more that a god is working through her. You know, yeah. she has her little because she picks it out at random for her. Like she reaches into the drawer, picks something out at random that's random to her. Like she's not thinking about what she's drawing, but but she it's gave everybody a book. But, the book was well, very the specific. Thing. But, like, she didn't know that he was going to see a crab at the market or that she was going to suddenly need to, like, realise that she needs to cook and needs a frying pan. Like, they, like they're random in that way, but also just that it could, like, rather than her being a god herself, a god is working through her. Is that yeah. a Japanese thing? Not that I'm aware of, but I, know it's I don't know. Other cultures, which is why I suggested it, that mm -hmm. uh, like other cultures have, like, not, like yes, obviously there are gods that live in the human world, but they also have gods that embody their followers and use them to help influence others. Hmm. Like, I don't know enough about Japanese culture to say whether or not that's something that's in their history, but I do know that that's in other histories and other and a lot of a lot of histories and god related religion stuff while it's not the same have a, have a lot of similar prospects in them like yep. you know a, like you know a lot of especially the ancient deities have a lot of similar you know there's a god of the sun and a god of the moon and like there's all these similar mm -hmm. even if they have their own mm -hmm. stories that aren't similar they have similar veins to them mm -hmm. even if those people never even crossed over in that history time like you know people from the Vikings and people from Egypt and people from Rome and Greece, like a lot of those people never would have seen one another, but they have a lot of gods that have similar characteristics. So while mm. I'm not saying that um, Chinese gods will be the same, they'll have some similar characteristics because humans think the same, no matter where they're from. Like mm. they, that's why stories are all very similar in a way because stories come from humans and we all have we all think of things in a similar way there's only so many ways you can think of things like one of the things that isn't like the sun or the moon the three fates show up a lot in different mm. mythologies yeah a lot and in and, different ways too yeah. they're not always just the three fates yeah. there's like yeah. the crone but there's also the the mother yes. of the goddess yeah. and the, like the three aspects yeah. of there's some, always something the three. it's in a lot of and yeah those sorts of things happen in lots of different religions yeah. and different ways like christianity and those sorts of got, um religions that have just the one god are very different in their way where they've only got that one whereas a lot of other religions while they may have a main god they'll have a lot of offshoot deities hmm the, the, there definitely was, and I don't know if it's a Western thing for me or or if it's just the human thing for me, uh, I kind of wanted to give, like I wanted to know more about Sayuri Komachi, like about the librarian, like because there was this running thing of, mm. of everyone would see her and go, oh, she's this really large woman, you know. Mm. <laughs> and then yeah. like Marshmallow Man, I thought that was yeah, like I think was it Alyssa who said reminded of Totoro? Yeah, 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 yeah. And you're like, what's? Well, yeah, I wanted I, something yeah. kind of. I, I don't kept know, imagining. Oh, I, I can't I remember the story of yeah. something is suddenly revealed there, but I, I don't, mm. I don't know. I can't remember the character's name from Spirited Away. The the, Kamachi. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I can't think of her with her big nose and hair and and oh, all no, that. Oh no, no, I was thinking oh, no. the guy downstairs. Oh no, the, um, the, the oh, you um, mean your barber? 
you Baba, yeah. I kept thinking Baba Yaga. <laughs> you Baba, I kept thinking of her as this big, large woman. <laughs> oh, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I did so... like that um, she did seem very mythical in the beginning, um, but then you got to, like, know little bits about her through the story, like the um, she liked the, the honey dome cookies, which is normal, but, like, the hairpin, she had the hairpin, and they mentioned in the first one or the, two stories, and the then they find out that it was market? her. Um, you gave some insight into yeah, I think it was early, a little earlier than that as well. She said something was from from the person she loves, and then the the lady from the market said, "Yeah, it's from from the person that you know, her husband." And so, like, it made her a little more less mythical and a little more human to see these. And it was really nice to see all these little tiny bits that it, they told you about her through each story and each interaction, um, with the small interactions with her. That you're like, oh, so. Because I think there's one story they said she did something for work and then she met um, her husband and then she did something else and now she was a librarian. So she had job changes as well. So she wasn't always this mystical librarian. Um, yeah. What was the other thing? And she, yeah, she was a school teacher. Um, and then what was it? They They met when they bumped into each other reaching for the same packet of honey domes on the... <laughs> on the shelf in the supermarket i'm like that's adorable <laughs> <laughs> so i like the way the honey domes kept coming through yeah sorry i but... thought that was nice every time someone saw her they were all surprised they all described very differently how she looked and they all were like oh honey domes <laughs> oh she keeps sewing supplies in there <laughs> well needle felting but they all I often refer to it as slowing supplies sorry I dropped something well <laughs> I, I think that's like another one that's very um universal because I was like it's like those Danish um yeah you know the little shortbready cookies that come in the round yeah. tin and it's like oh biscuits and there's always sewing supplies in there I'm like <laughs> yeah maybe we've, this is we've a got universal a tin. thing too we've yeah. got a tin of those Danish biscuits sitting at work that are almost finished from Christmas and I'm like Oh, when that empties, I'm gonna have to buy some sewing supplies for work and put them in there. We've got a tiny little kit. I should just like put it in there. <laughs> so my question for you all is, can I cross off my magical realism bingo square for this book? <laughs> yeah. I think so. There's just really something going on. Like, is it magical enough to call it magical realism? Or or is it just, you know? <laughs> I just use the library square. Yeah, oh, that's library right, square. I, I thought, haven't looked at it. We'll <laughs> Maybe mark them both and see which one you read next that might cross off the other one. That's what I do. <laughs> I put your post it somewhere. You got guys a... have a bingo game? Yeah. Oh, yes. <laughs> have to get Bobby to pass it over to you, Alyssa, if you yes. want to play. Happy <laughs> yeah. you. Um, you'll, you'll you'll discover, Alyssa. This is this is not just books. This is all the things. <laughs> yes, <laughs> pets all the things. and cooking and journaling and yeah, yeah, yeah. many <laughs> many things. Many many things. Yep. So we only really we... just we haven't gone through the rest of the stories. Do we want to? No, I going? haven't. I was just thinking of the next one. Which one was the? I'm just trying to flip to it so I remember. Rio thirty five accounts department of a furniture manufacturer. Uh, what was he? He's the one who wanted to have an antique store. That's he right, wants yeah. <laughs> and he's, I... he's given the book How Do Worms Work? In where he discovers that plants are doing all this stuff underground to support their structures above ground. And I think he uses that as a metaphor for his current job will provide the resources and then he can, with help, yep. uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think with this off. one, it... It, the book is reinforcing what he's getting from other people because he gets, I can't remember exactly how the story went in this one, but he meets yeah. the per, um, or gets referred or someone tells him about the person who does, um, he get, is he the one that gets he a reads a, He gets he like a, a little flyer that he reads yes. that it's about, yeah. This is the, the newsletter or something. Cat, it was. Cat, cat, cat cafe, cafe one, of course. Cat cafe, yeah. Yeah, That's where right. he's doing both. Well, he sees yes. the flyer and, and yeah, uh, at the at the um, entry, the reception area, and, um, yeah, um, realises that he can do both. I did feel it was very weird having that 10-year age difference between his girlfriend and him, but then again I thought, is that more normal in Japanese society? 
yeah, I figured it was. Um, <laughs> and she, but she didn't age, seem immature in any way. She seemed very adult. At least she was 25 and not like 20. <laughs> the thing about Japan is that you're just as likely to see it go in the other direction as well. Yep. Mm -hmm. Well, there uh, is a 10-year age. Oh, sorry, Alyssa. I was going to say at least three of us here have a really big gap between yeah. our husbands and ourselves. <laughs> Ours, Chris and mine is actually a 10-year gap. Yep, same but with ours. But yes. I'm older, but he's more mature. I'm not, you know. <laughs> Same gender than me, and I'm 15 years older. Yeah. I think I, in in Western society, you sort of like you see a big age gap, and you're like between younger people. At least it's a, a sort of a red flag. I'm glad that yeah. it really showed their bond in this. Even though he was a little bit immature, she was very mature, and it I, showed that their was... bond was actually something very strong. And you know, it wasn't superficial at all, and and they were supporting each other. Yeah. It was actually yeah. kind of interesting watching him actually finally realise that he didn't know his girlfriend that well at all, yes. actually. And um, she was very mature and very wise in her own way and he yes. just hadn't really explored that aspect of her at that stage and yeah. had this sort of mindset of who she was and wasn't really seeing her as a total person. Yep. And she was very forgiving of his grumpy, grumpy, um, <laughs> grumpiness and his, his yeah uh, a little bit hurtful words <laughs> i think like, that's because they you're obviously tired. Get i'm going home well. yeah she's yeah. like yeah you're tired i'm going home you're not <laughs> you're not thinking straight i'm going to give you a pass by leaving <laughs> letting you think Which about quite things. a mature thing to do in yeah, all honesty it was a very <laughs> mature thing to do yeah. <laughs> it's interesting too her parents were pretty accepting of him mm. which i wouldn't have seen in western books no as mm. well which might speak to what um what kim was saying too that yeah. in western when you see that age gap the red how did they, how did they meet that was an interesting sub little tidbit i can't remember what it was though they met we at a um antiques fair um the first time and then they bumped into each other again a week later somewhere i think another at the beach and he right. found a beautiful and piece of glass that was rare that's yeah. right, yeah. Sea glass, yeah, red yes, sea glass. Yes, the red, red sea glass oh, yeah. that when he's in her, her room um, and she she's talking it. to him and he's realising how, how mature she is and that she's actually really smart and she's um, what she's doing really means a lot to her and she's doing it really well and it's mm. really serious for her, not a side hobby. And he sees yeah. a little bit of red glass in the bottle and he's like... But oh. that is, she's kept aside. <laughs> yep. With the glasses him, him, yeah. That was well too. done. Yeah, and I think it's actually quite clever because it is the kind of assumptions that an older partner with a young, much younger partner would make about their particular choices of what they're doing, especially in modern age where they don't understand like how they're managing to do have a, an online career and and how that all works and everything because they've followed the very traditional path of having a career and understanding outside of that would be hard. So I thought it was clever a choice of how that she ran it because I was like, I kind of want to be annoyed with him, but actually I can see why this has happened because he has gone through the very traditional steps of how you have your job and everything on those lines. So I can see how he ended up where he was and it was good that he was mind was getting opened and he was actually willing to accept things. So, yeah. I and I think it's him. also a thing about mm -hmm. creative pursuits as well. She was being mm -hmm. creative and sometimes a lot of people will see that as a hobby. Because yes. it might be something someone does as a hobby, but it also might be some, something someone does seriously as a business. So you've also got that aspect as well, that it's a creative passion um, mm. that a lot of people would see as a hobby. So, yeah. yeah. And that seems to be a really big difference between Japanese culture and Western culture as well, which is you, it, it seems like people have a dead end job, which they don't like because you need a job and you have to do it. And, and everyone's so well behaved, whereas uh, I'm from the US and we all just rebel and we're stupid about it and we, you know, don't settle down until our, you know, mid 20s and maybe get a job then. <laughs> That's why the fourth story was kind of surprising, honestly, because that kind of mindset from the mother in Japan is such a rare thing. <laughs> yeah. But that was me skipping story three, sorry. So. <laughs> Well, we don't have to go in order. Perhaps it would be uh, a, well, a good segue. I think it's relevant to actually discuss it in conjunction with story two because I think there's a lot of, um, that's where I found the story that had the most overlap in some respects because you had 
um sorry I've forgotten her name we had Hema in story two who was had there was this perception that she was staying at home with her parents because she wasn't really getting anything done and and moving forward with herself and things like that but she actually was whereas then in story four you've got Hiroya who is um sort of not getting anywhere because he's mentally in a space where he can't deal with what's going on around him and he doesn't know how to into he's obviously neurodivergent in some way I'm guessing oh yes <laughs> yes I really related to him super related to him <laughs> um and so he he was struggling in different ways but was more actually going on there lot what we'd assumed for him from um Roy's Roy boys I've never been able to make that sound in Japanese yeah yeah. Um, perspective um it, it, so I thought that was interesting to have those two stories with one actually being it was you know was not actually what he assumed yeah yeah his mum was a lot more forgiving than I would have been I would have been like go and get yourself a fucking job <laughs> I don't care what it is I don't care if you have to bounce around but do something <laughs> uh, I did appreciate in that story though the uh, story four um that we you get um it, like he kind of works his way through it um I mean to be fair yes uh being kind of in that situation with a child who is just now moving into this and we're having to kind of force the issue of you have to get a job you cannot sit in your room all day I'm sorry it's not good for you um yeah. like it was not I almost wanted to be like if I thought they would read it if I suggested to them I actually would have suggested my kid please read this one little novel like this one little vignette because this character talks you through and he works it out and he gets himself out of it and he finds his way and he's and he's like oh I can do this because look it's an opportunity and I need to have some sort of a thing and he takes it like work you know and um and then he discovers oh actually I like doing I think it was, was it was it um he was drawing wasn't it he was he was the he was illustrator drawing, yeah. Yeah. yeah 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 and figures out how to make that work you know and but you you get the internal learning curve that he goes through which I quite appreciated mm-hmm. yeah um, I like the I, I really related to that thing where um being in a sales job is like just got super depressed he couldn't handle it he didn't like it at all didn't like talking to all these people but when he wasn't forced and he got to do it on his own terms in a quieter setting um with friendly people who shared things with him, um, he was quite all right. I mean, he wasn't forced to do it. He, he actually found socialising was great and he was socialising with people that shared, or, you know, shared something with him or, or were a lot quieter um, and he did really well. He's like, it, you know, cleaning jobs, not the best, but I, I enjoy like, I enjoy this type of work where I don't have to be, yeah. I'm not forced to be social. Um, yeah. Yeah, I'm not forced to talk to people as a job. I'm not forced to, yeah, um, talk to people all day or be social. Um, I can do it on my terms and I've just got a job that I can do. Yeah. yeah. And I, I liked, I respected that aspect of how the story had as a whole had people from lots of different mindsets and different yeah. ways of being. So it was really good that she managed to to do that. It's Yes, it had a formula, but it was... It, it, each time different because of the person. Yes. Yeah. Should we go back to story three? Yes, because <laughs> I'm pretty sure Mel likes this one. <laughs> Honestly, this was probably my favourite out of all of yeah, them. Yeah, it was a good one. Yeah, Natsumi, 40 hey. former magazine editor. Who spent a lot of it cranky at Shuji? <laughs> oh, yeah. I did, <laughs> and then I felt bad that I felt cranky at him. <laughs> <laughs> he was actually supportive. <laughs> yeah. I, I I must admit I fell into the trap of assuming that he was just doing the typical Japanese male stereotypical you've got to take care of the child, it's your responsibility kind of stuff. Yeah. And yeah. Um, but that's where the trap is when you're looking at one person's perspective and not right. you know, she was an unreliable yeah. narrator in this yes. particular state. Yes. Yep. Yeah. But she was very, very in her own head about her own problems too. Like she was not able to talk. And I think that was something that I think is a really good message to come out of that one, that it's a good idea to talk to people around you because you don't know where help is going to come from. You don't know where good advice is going to come from. But if you talk to people, you can actually get those things. Mm. Sorry, go ahead, Kirsten. No, no, you go. It's good. 
I was going to say, even though she is very in her head, she's still kind of aware enough to realise that the lady who took over her job mm. is kind of maybe jealous of her as well. Yeah, mm. I think that was sort of a slow yeah. realisation though as well because at first she just was really jealous. <laughs> but I think then, that's... Yeah, she was a jealous one. I think that's where the danger was for Natsumi. Natsumi is exactly that kind of person that I think does get stuck in their head so much because they are super intelligent. They, She is very capable. She is very good. And so she didn't share her problems because of that, if that makes sense. I should be able to figure it out myself. Yes. Mm. Yeah, when people sort of grow up like that where they're intelligent and they don't need to ask for help, when they do need to ask for help, they don't know how to, they expect to be able to work it out because that's what they've always done. So when they yeah. do run into a problem, they don't have the experience that, oh, you just ask someone because mm. they've never had to and they've never been told that, or never experienced that that's what you do. Mm. So it's almost like she had the um, interpersonal skills to be able to see what you were saying, Elizabeth, about how this other person was feeling and thinking about mm. these sorts of things, but not the intrapersonal understanding of herself enough to be able to understand how to navigate that because she never had to lean on it so hard. Well, and I also appreciated that, like, having realised that she she shows support for the other woman, mm. uh, it's like, oh, you know, this thing that she's accomplished is a really big deal and, you know, that should be appreciated. I actually enjoyed the complexity of that situation yes. a lot, actually, like, because that it, she recognised that she couldn't be doing that job right at that time, but she could still feel jealous but also feeling support for that person. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I didn't think it was it like she had a turning point where she stopped um, judging a person or judging her. Like I think the the, the she gets an or gets announced as the chief editor or something. Yeah, she she's gets standing the there. She's look. She's like, oh look, she's like acting all tough, and then she's like, oh, actually, maybe that's not what she's feeling. Maybe she's acting this way to put on a front, but inside she's she's not like that. Um, mm. She's a bit embarrassed or a bit unsure or a bit nervous actually underneath. Um, yeah. So she didn't take what that person uh, was presenting um, in her expression and her body language. She's like, oh, maybe that's not true. Maybe I should think more deeply about this. Mm. Yeah. I think I related to that story more than any of the others. Just the whole, it reminds me a lot of when my kids were real little and like I can remember especially just after Xander, I was in between Xander and Claire because I'd gone back to work at school and I was on a class and not, but when after Claire I was doing the librarian job. So it was a bit different. But I remember having more than one breakdown going, I can be a good teacher or I could be a good parent. I can't be both. Mm -hmm. And like just losing my <laughs> mind over it, you know, because it was, it felt like, if I put in the work that I need to put in to be a really good teacher, I'm neglecting my child. And if I put in, if I come home and be in the moment with my child as much as I want to be, then I go to work the next day and I'm on the back foot and I'm not doing the best job I could do as a teacher. And it, it, and it was so, so hard. And it's still hard, but it's easier now than it was when they were tiny. But, like, oh, I really, really related to it, like this whole feeling of, like, being expected to be able to have it all have the, to be the mother and be the have a career and it's it's really hard so yeah I've related to her really well really lots yeah mm. I, I thought you would Kirsten when I was reading this one I'm like oh I think every parent would relate though every female especially um mm. every woman uh every mother I think would relate more heavily because you know it's just <laughs> just the way things go unfortunately and I was so mad at her husband when she said, can you pick the kid up from daycare this time? Because And he's like, no, I can't. And I was like, so yeah. sad. But she also didn't say what was going on either. Like no. There was no exploration of actually whose need is more here. Mm. Yeah. So she was doing it to herself as much as he was not helping. Yeah. But as soon as she expressed what she was feeling and why she was feeling it um, and everything. He's like, okay. And they agreed to like, he'd drop her off every day and she'd, um, um, and they'd work her hours so she could go in earlier and, and do her thing. And he'd drop her off or she thinks she went freelance anyway. But um, as soon as she was like, I really, you know, I can't, I can't do this. I'm really having a tough time. He's like, 
oh, okay, what can I do? What do I need to do to help you? Um, how do we solve this? And I'm like, mm. oh, damn it, he's a good guy. Yeah. <laughs> I actually and kind of liked, and... he didn't actually get it the first time. When she yeah. first blew up, yes. he was so confused. And yes. I actually liked that because yeah. she wasn't in a space of communication. She was um, she was just emotionally reacting. Yeah. But once she could communicate with him, he did pick up on it and, and get there. It was good. It's really lovely that Madame Mitsua, um, you know, loves her enough that she makes the special, you know, lunch meeting with her because she couldn't meet with her the the day before. Mm. And that was a really nice twist. Yeah, it was a nice really, affirmation. I didn't really get that, but you could tell, you know, they just had that deep connection. Mm. And well, it was nice to hear her how, because you heard how... Um, she changed, uh, Madame Mizzou changed her life, um, that was a big thing for her, but then she tells her how she changed um, uh, Madame Mizzou's life, yeah. Um, yeah. how much it meant to her, how scared she had been, how worried she was and all of these things and that it was her support that helped her to actually do this in the first place, otherwise she wouldn't have yeah. um, do the serialisation um, in the magazine. So yeah. it was nice to hear that, you know, I think that helped her a lot knowing that <sighs> she did a lot to get this thing done. If it wasn't for her, this never would have happened. Mm. Mm. I also like the element of the story that was sort of recognising that um, you don't own your workplace, the loyalty that you have to stay when it's not working for you anymore. Like yeah. you're not getting the satisfaction out of the job, the hours aren't working for you, whatever it is that's the problem, like there is the capability to go and look elsewhere. That doesn't mean you're going to find the perfect thing. That's not a promise, but it is an option that you can do. And um, I thought that was a good message as well for yes. people. And I did like at the end where she's talking about the new office she goes to work work for. And like the little kids are there, and he's like, "Can you ask your daughter if she which one she likes more?" And then the other girl's sitting there like reading a book while her mum's working. I'm like, "Oh, that's so lovely." Yeah, I felt fairy tale ending too. Yeah, that was a bit of a fairy tale. But I have a feeling, you know, um, maybe it's the kind of workplace where you know if your child's too disrupted to bring into the workplace because only one person I think had their kid there. At the time, yeah. But yeah, because she didn't no, have her right. kid there at the time. The, her no, kid wasn't. No. They asked her to take it home yeah. for her, her kid. Yeah. She was saying that her colleague only had her child there because the school was cancelled for the day or that's something. Right. That's right. Yeah, yes. that's, that's right. right. So yes. they had to bring her. Like, it wasn't like it's a, I just bring her in because it's a child-friendly yeah. place. It was more of a, I have to bring my child with me to work because I know that it's child-friendly. I can work, but their childcare situation for the day isn't yes. available yes it's yes. not that her bringing her child's work is the child care solution yeah. Yeah. it's yeah. a it seems that like her workplace a... was re willing to yes. help her out in the tough spot and say yeah sure yep she can come sit with like you while you work a, yeah. if your child can be here and you're able yes. to work we're more than happy for them yeah. to be here because our our products are helpful if a mm. small child reads them and they enjoy them like that's good feedback but also we obviously don't want people just bringing their child in every day because that's also not <laughs> yeah. helpful. That would work. just be disruptive. But, yeah, that was yeah. the sort of thing like yeah, was she was in a tough was spot and, uh, and they were like, yeah, sure, yeah. <laughs> it's fine. It just seemed very, you can bring your child if you have to and no one's going to care, but also please don't, it's like they weren't, yeah. it, was, it was more of a like don't overuse that privilege. Yes. Yeah, don't also, if your child thing. starts, um, you know, misbehaving, you probably have to go home, <laughs> honestly. <laughs> I'm pretty sure it would have been like that. It's like the kid starts playing up, mum has to take them away. <laughs> reminds, reminds me of when um, teachers used to do that when I was young. Like the teachers would, if they had, had to bring their kid into school, yeah. Um, and they'd sit in the classroom while you guys were having class. I don't yeah, know you, I don't um, think you get away my, with that now. Yeah, <laughs> one of my, um, uh, one yeah. of my uh, old workmates, and it wouldn't be that long ago that she did it. It would be like less than 20 years. Her mum worked in a school up in um, the hills, so mm. not too far away but slightly country. And if one of the kids couldn't go to school because they had a fever or something, her kids were really well behaved, so she just sat them in the corner of her classroom with a book and they behaved themselves so, and I think because it was a very slightly more country as well, that was okay. <laughs> it was a very small uh, school. Yeah, no, my, my school we have uh, had, okay, again, it's not not to be overused. Yes. I've had situations where a staff member has brought a kid in 
for part of a day or whatever because they were having a childcare conflict. Uh, post COVID, it's definitely not okay if you bring your sick child in. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, no, my school, there's still, yeah, there is occasionally you'll wander around and go, I, I think maybe twice last year, you know, there's like, there's a nine year old sitting, wow, they seem a little young for the year 11. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so. I've certainly had heaps of kids um, sitting in in PL events after school with teachers. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because well, that's a the different teachers thing. can't get an after school babysitter. Yeah, <laughs> well, it, I think it's a fairly standard thing for because especially oh, yeah. if the kids go to that school that the teacher oh, yeah. teaches at, can't um, take but them the teacher, somewhere else. And, yeah. It, yeah, it's after school time, so yes. they've got us hang out somewhere. So they just hang out in the back, and yeah, uh, uh, at varying degrees of it's okay because it does depend a lot on how the kid behaves. <laughs> very much depends on the kids how the kids behave yes certainly very appreciative when there are workplaces which are understanding of that yeah yeah like having, I, when having i was worked in... in one workplace which ironically was a school where they weren't understanding of it was a bit like mm -hmm. yeah because yeah. i remember when my mum used to do like clean schools um some different schools every now and then if I was uh, she couldn't get anyone to look after me and she had to go to work she'd just take me with her I think she even took me to her office an office once but she probably wouldn't have taken my brother <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but me I was fine because I just followed her around or I sat and read I just followed her around she'd be like here take this rag wipe that desk over so yeah <laughs> it depends on the kid <laughs> so what you're saying is you were the good kid and your brother yes. was the kid. <laughs> yeah, definitely <laughs> <laughs> oh dear shall we talk about story five five, five was that was the old man the, yeah. the so the Maceo, oh, yes. last one yeah Maceo. Or mr gono as he was referred to earlier in the story when he was briefly referred to <laughs> so i i haven't finished this one so possibly i should pop out now <laughs> would you consider it a spoiler I don't think there's any spoilers I'm not too in this book about it in no. this one. So yeah, okay, I'll, I'll just. Um... It's up to you, Lisa. Entirely, it's your Thank experience. You. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Nice things happen. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> nice things happen. I thought it was quite nice that um he started, you know, learning something new, experience. He's he's gone. I think a lot of retired people experience this, this that. Um, especially men, I think. Women mm. don't. Women usually have a support network who will stay with them outside of work. Um, mm. But I don't think a lot of men, so I think is there is a problem that a lot of men, once they stop working, don't have a support network of friends where they'll go out and see, or they're just not as social. Um, mm. I see this in people who come to my workplace as well. The older men are usually a little less social and more they they tend to talk uh, there's quite a few who will talk a lot <laughs> because yeah. i think they don't get that social um get to be in the social settings where they get to talk to people much and i do notice in some women that i think don't have um to be you don't get to be in social settings very much now that they're retired they will talk a lot to you which we love <laughs> absolutely <laughs> don't mind but you notice that that more pe some certain people talk more than others um so yeah i'm not surprised by this story where he's like oh my life was the company um now i, I don't actually have friends i thought i had friends but i don't have friends and they mm. start to sort of almost spiral um because mm. they re and, and feel like there's nothing left of their lives because they finish working what else do they do um he so it was uses the word remainder remainder the of his life yeah, yeah. <laughs> Naomi, what were you going to say? Um, I was just going to say that, especially like with a lot of our rural patients, you have one or two, like one of two type of old men. You have the old men who go to the pub and have their pub friends, or you have the old men who have their wife, and that's mm. it. That's yeah. their mm. social circle. And you can tell the difference about those two men by when they call you to talk to you about making an appointment, booking their surgery, whatever it is they're calling you about, the men who have their drinking buddies or their fishing buddies or whatever it is that they do in their rural part of Queensland, they'll be on the phone for five to 10 minutes, ask you the basics and they'll be off the phone. The men who only have their wife will be on the phone for you for 15 or 20 minutes and then ask you to talk to their wife and give them all the same information. That's if their wife didn't call you in the first place. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, usually I'm calling them, especially if you uh, book surgery. So yeah. I'll call them. I'll talk to them for 15, 20 minutes, go through all of like how, you know, theatre date, theatre time, you know, fasting, what medications they take. I go through all that sort of stuff. And then he's like, oh, could you just give all that information to my wife as well? Uh, why could I not just talk to your wife to begin with? If you didn't want me to give you the information, that's fine. I don't care. But at the start of the conversation, just tell me I need you to speak with my wife. Or do what my dad does, which is let me just put you on speakerphone. My wife's right here. <laughs> I, uh, I appreciate this distinction, Naomi, because I immediately know which of these categories my uncle falls into. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the thing, like, I feel like, especially, so um, I've worked with two big groups of doctors now, and the older groups of doctors that would be nearing that retirement age have made friends with people outside of their work because they, like, at my urology clinic, they all did biking together and they did a lot of cycling and they went on bike rides and that sort of stuff. A lot of the doctors I work with now all do golf together. So they do a lot of golfing days and, like, that's how they keep their social life alive because one of our doctors has just recently retired, but he still does golf days with everyone and, like, he's still keeping his social life alive because they've created that social life with their work friends. Yeah. And I think that that's how that generation, which is, like, a generation younger than what he would be, is, like, keeping that circle of friends alive once they retire yes they're sort of creating something from their work friends outside of work so they have something to keep them going yes they've realized that their friends uh, their parents and their grandparents didn't have that I think a lot of people see that yeah they go I don't don't want that don't want that have have you heard of men's sheds yes Mm. there is quite a few people who um go to men's sheds and they tend to be the, the the same thing they're much more social um yeah. much more able to take care of themselves mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah because women women do do the emotional labor in a, a partnership in a couple yeah. often yeah. Yeah. and there's yeah. there, there was more traditionally you know uh in that you've got a men who their only their wife is their only friend, like close friend, like that they talked yeah. about personal intimate stuff. They have mates, but and I and it's not good for mental health when that person becomes a widower for mm. anyone. Yeah, yeah. So right. I would yay men's shit. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. look, I don't think my dad has any problems because he has pub days with some mates. I think some ex work mates and stuff. Um, and he goes, oh, every time I bloody go there, they're talking about their prostates. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't think they have any problems sharing personal information at least. Good. That's good. <laughs> well, I would just like to say on a personal note, I am very grateful for you guys both being my friend group and my hobby, <laughs> which is what I got from this story. Mm-hmm. This reminded me quite a lot of like too watching my like hearing about I was I was quite young when my grandfather retired, but I was I was old enough. I was probably about eight or nine when he retired so I was old enough to be to pick up to be listening and to pick up like the women in the family talking about it and I recall like my my step-grandmother because he he had a second wife like she was talking to my mom and she was like we have to get your father to do something because he's driving me nuts because he was at home all the time and he'd run out of all those things that he was he was a he was an engineer, so he tinkered, right? And he worked in, and he would work in the garage and he would build things. So he'd gone through and he'd built all these new shelves and he'd built a bread, he'd prepared the, the children's toolbox, even though he had no children anymore, right? He'd done all these things that he would talk, and then he was nagging her for things to do. And she's like, go away. <laughs> and so they had to like, and then it had like something similar whenever we had um like an adopted uncle, like he was not married into the family. He was just like a really good friend. And when he retired, his wife was like, we have to give him something to do. And they sent him to the community center, oddly enough, which in the States, they don't have men's sheds. The closest you get is generally a community center of yeah. some kind, which I thought was actually quite nice, even though a lot of stuff happens in the library. The library is in the community center mm. and they do, they do access other services in that community center. Like the, yeah. the the editor, she goes and she and she does a little bit in the playground with her child first before they go into the actual library. And this man, he learns how to play a game and then he kind of makes he swings by the library as well just to kind yeah. of see what he so he could get a book about something so, about the game so he could learn a bit more um yeah. and Roe Ro was there for the market before he went into the library yeah yeah I like the, um 
Yeah, there are a lot of libraries that do have the community centres attached. Mine yep. doesn't, but it's a big library. is connected to the council chamber and it's a big library and they have a lot of spaces where they do, yep. like, you know, um, mm. like they've got a computer room where they, they teach a lot of community events actually inside the library premises. Mm. But, yeah, I know the other one down the road, it's got the community centre and the library is in the same building. Um, I think that's all very common at least in South Australia but I'd probably, probably say it's very common in a lot of places yeah. the funny I mean, thing is when it comes to my parents is they're actually the reverse mm -hmm. my dad's the social one he's the one who goes out and has things to do and has hobbies and things like that my mum is the one who doesn't really go out much at all and she dabbles in hobbies but she doesn't really have something and it's I feel like it is very much one of those things that's gendered but it's not a hard line <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I like this guy. He, I related to him. I'm older and looking to retire in the next five years. Mm. But um, I like his realization that he, you know, one thing he learned was 65 isn't old. He just feels middle aged. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I liked that he got to repair the relationship with his kid too, like, um, in some way, like, and I thought that was quite nice that uh, um, they got to have an adult relationship together too, which was good. He wasn't trying to infantilize her and be like, "Oh, but last time I remember you, you were a child." Like, he did at least mm. accept his relationship wasn't as good as as the relation as the as her relationship with their mother was, and. Mm. Um, yeah, I really liked when he started spending time with her outside of the mother being there. That was lovely. Yes, yes. yes I liked yeah. that. Yeah. And also, like, realising that he's had a bigger impact than he thought. Mm -hmm. uh, that I did she... like his, sorry, his little crab entered the story twice in two different yeah. ways. Mm. Yeah, like, he, he um, like, she shares that, that memory that she has of words that he said just, you know, yeah. off the cuff sort of thing. Uh, and that has really meant something to her, but also that um, that he didn't then try to own those words because the way it's phrased is she has taken his words and made them like special to her, mm. and, and so instead of sort of like him trying to own that as his influence, yeah. even though some of it is a little bit so. Yeah. And I like how she's also teaching him stuff now. Like he's like, oh, I like this poetry. And she helps him understand it more about how mm -hmm. to understand poetry. And so he actually seeks out advice from her instead of just it always being the other way around. Um, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and instead of him, he's like, oh, I want to know more. Tell me. And it's a sort of, yeah, that's that where that adult relationship starts with your parents is when they ask you for advice. And mm -hmm. yeah, it was really sweet because I feel like a lot of, daughters don't have strong relationships with their fathers <laughs> so it was nice to see someone who it was originally that sort of thing where he didn't have a relation with his daughter develop that relationship like it's never Funny enough I feel like the daughter did feel like she had a relationship with him and it was yes. him needing to make the connection yes. with her and realize yeah. he yeah mm -hmm. meanwhile the fact that the um the old guy who from the second story who had owned an antique store showed up at the back of this one. I was like, yeah, I was not oh, expecting that one. But I yeah, was so yeah. glad he hadn't run off. Yes, and then yeah. they clarify, like, they still keep his part reasonably small, but they're like, mm. he's like, oh, this guy thought I ran off. So all these yes. other people thought I did. Oh, but I, I you know, the, the real estate guy, um, I bumped into him and he's the one that helped me get this job and I explained it. So now they all, like, all these regulars <laughs> suddenly know after, like, 20 years that he didn't actually run off. It's just this one guy thought he did. He was actually just going to get another job so he could pay off his debt. Yeah. <laughs> Which also that just goes hilarious. to show how a tiny piece of misinformation can just, yes. like... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm like, oh, thank God he didn't run off because I really liked it. As soon as I saw it, it's like, the man with the knitted cap, I'm like flipping back through the book what's his name what's his name and they're like Mr. Abbott Gower I'm like it is the same guy right yeah it is the same guy it of course is. I had to do that a couple of times I actually had to because yes, I was doing the audio I book and I couldn't flip back I was I had to pause yeah. and go look online and I'm like is it the same thing but yeah because I had the same problem where I couldn't get the ebook from the library because they had like 100 copies and there was like an 18 week wait for it <laughs> 
Um, yeah, I imagine that's one of the problems with the audiobook. I read it so fast that all of the names were really clear in my head. So when he showed up, I was like. <laughs> <laughs> also, yeah. I appreciated like the connections between the stories were, uh, weren't what you might expect. If yeah. that makes sense. Like yeah. uh, they're a bit more subtle and tangential, yeah. um, which I, I quite liked. Mm -hmm. And you just get the sense of this like community, like not necessarily close knit. Everybody doesn't know each other, but everybody has their part and like helps or shows mm. up here. Or, like, everybody has customers. in a way some small effect on everybody else. That's so you're right. always, uh, what's this, was it the one with the, 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 the cleaner, the, the um, manga reading guy. Was it him that he was saying, yeah, you could step out inside of society and be part of society? I think it was yes. all, all the last few stories especially was because um, Mr. Abigail was saying it as well. Like, you know, you take out the glass and now you're part of that society. It's just one sheet of glass just, um, keeping mm. you apart. And mm. once you just remove this one little sheet of glass, you're part of it. It doesn't take Actually, too much. Yeah. love the fact exactly that what you're saying Alyssa there that they didn't try to turn it the author mm, didn't yes. try to turn it into this is the newfound family and they all get together at the end of the barbecue yeah. or something which is what a western <laughs> story would have totally done with it all at the end yeah yeah <laughs> it was very subtle but yeah. um, it was still there <laughs> a one like description of this kind of novel structure would be like a mosaic novel mm -hmm. uh, and that is mm -hmm. I think a pretty good description for this yeah, yeah. cool I don't know that term I like it yeah but yeah, I yeah. immediately know what it means. Cloud Atlas would yeah. be another one of those, wouldn't it? Uh, I, I haven't read Cloud Atlas. I've no. I have seen the movie. I haven't read the book. So yeah, God, I the movie would, is. <laughs> would have to qualify that, but it could be. I don't know whether Cloud Atlas is maybe a bit more connected uh, than a mosaic novel might be. But I would again, I haven't read the book, so. Um, definitive mm. answer cannot be given on that. Let's just say they tried to do something in the movie that I'm not sure was so present in the book. Okay. <laughs> Maybe mm. I'll get to it when you. <laughs> Cloud Atlas by David this... Mitchell. That's yes. the one. Um, I read it with um, Sword and Laser back in the day. So um, it's uh, it's an interesting read. <laughs> I have heard it is interesting. And then I yeah. heard that the movie was terrible. So, <laughs> well, I, I don't think I'd go for the don't movie. Don't get me started on <laughs> casting white characters and putting them yeah. into other race roles. That's a... That was definitely, yeah, not great. Um, they did it for a reason. I understand why they did it. I just don't think yeah. it was a smart choice. <laughs> it, and, and as for the book, like, it comes from a more literary tradition uh than genre so that has its own like ups and downs there so um yeah. but that is uh, a different book and that's not what we're here to discuss <laughs> so yeah. what that's i've got a tangent sorry what are they... <laughs> one of these definitions say that it's a story told from the perspective of different people which isn't quite the same as this mm. and another says it's a set of interconnected stories of which there's a couple of interconnected like people or places or things, which makes more sense. Yeah. Um the the way that I'm familiar with it is it's like sort of a bunch um a bunch of stories with some overlap, but that will give you a an overall picture um of something. So in this case it would be like the community. Star um, C. Yeah. Would, would Starla C be a mosaic novel? No, no, definitely not. Oh, okay. Um, another example in, I would say, a movie form would be Love Actually is very much mm -hmm. like that. Like there's lots yeah, of yeah. stories about different characters and they do kind of like know each other, but it's not, it's not right. one big story. You know yeah. what I mean? And the Rashomon thing is, a, uh, is also called mosaic, but it's completely different, whereas that's more like the story of the five blind people touching the elephant anyway i like the idea of mosaic and i think that suits this and everybody's yeah. their own little like this person's a little bit of a green in all of the pieces of the mosaic and yeah, yeah the antique guy is a bit of yellow <laughs> 
I thought um, uh, that reminds me of the, the antique one where he was just so fascinated with um this English spoon. Mm. I'm like, oh, God, I've seen so many of those at the op shop. <laughs> <laughs> but it's so, it was such Probably a good example of like the reverse of the kind of thing we would do with that sort of thing yeah. where we'd get something that was Japanese and be like, fascinated yeah. in that. It just seems it like that. it's very foreign to him. But for me, I'm like, oh, that's so boring. <laughs> but I did well, realise at the time that it was very foreign to him and to me it's not, whereas something that wouldn't be foreign to him uh, would and bland would be very interesting to me. But Kim also did, I'm not sure if you noticed, but like the, the books that he was recommended, the book on worms, that's from the uh, from the London, like the Royal yeah, Society British of... British Horticulture or something? Yeah, yeah. Horticulture. Yeah. Um, so it is, so that fits in kind of with the spoon in that sense. Mm. Yeah. In the yeah. fifth... Yeah, British Royal Horticulture, Horticultural Society. <laughs> yeah. In the fifth chapter, I like that he figures out that he has no dress sense and that his wife's been dressing him. Oh, you know, I, I related that to my father so much. And then my mum said today, because um, we're going out to a, my cousin's birthday at a pub uh, on the weekend, and she goes, I told your father he just needs a short sleeve shirt and a pair of jeans. And he had to come down and he's wearing one and he's holding the other one. And he goes, either of these okay <laughs> and she goes that one's fine and then she's like that one uh, I like that one better and he goes good because that one's too small and she goes what's wrong with the pocket and he goes nothing she's like it's a come on stitch just got a hole I'm like oh my dad is terrible <laughs> he's not allowed to pick his own socks either because he can't tell black from navy blue <laughs> oh okay yeah that makes sense yeah I really appreciate my husband just buys only black socks because he's yeah. like, I, I'm colorblind. Yeah, and... the problem, yeah, the problem was dad had navy blue socks from work. Uh because yeah, his okay. uniform was navy blue. So yeah. yeah. Right. <laughs> just need to throw out all the navy blue socks, honestly. <laughs> What's up with you, Kat? You look so unimpressed. She's I want like... to read my favorite quote from this. I wrote it wrote it down because I thought it was really good. It was on page 36. Not, that probably works unless you've got the physical copy, sorry. <laughs> um, you may say that it was the book, but it's how you read a book that most is most valuable rather than any power it might have itself. I thought that I was a I did love that. I love that quote. Uh, a, uh, a, in praise of rereading in that respect as well. Yes. As, as yes. you bring new things and the experiences to the book that you've read before. And I feel like this is a book too that I felt very muchly would benefit from rereading, not right away, but like in several years' time or something when I'm at a different point in my life and that sort of stuff mm. where a different story might resonate with me differently and things like mm. that. So That's a really once point, I actually yeah. ticked the yes reread box in my journal. <laughs> in my book journal <laughs> I don't very often tick that one it's like yeah maybe because <laughs> it's got a yes no maybe and so it's almost always no or maybe it's not always it's very rarely a yes I was like yes definitive <laughs> <laughs> I have two books which I read read I read on average once a year and they're my my favorite books which I will never pick for book club because I was well advised don't pick what you love. Don't, no, don't yeah, do it. Don't pick what you love. <laughs> do not like Sarah. Sarah. Poor Sarah. <laughs> On that topic, guess what we're reading next? <laughs> what did you love? What, what are the two books you love, Lisa? Uh, My Family and Other Animals by Gerald Durrell. Okay. And now I'm having a mental blank. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you get I'll asked, get back yeah. to you with the second one. <laughs> Put you on the spot. Um, was there was there anything else that we have to discuss for the book, or shall we call it a night? Mm -hmm. I feel like that's everything I've got. Yeah, I think that's and I actually have notes. <laughs> <laughs> of course you do. And like the rest of us slackers. Yes, yes. I do. All I do I'm putting my out. finger at all of you. <laughs> I, I was looking at all these the like all the recommendations, and I'm like, moon petals. I think they refer to it differently in the story, the Moon Petals, the astrology book. I'm like, yes, oh, I do. wouldn't really be interested in reading that one. I don't think. I'm just like, like the there's evolution so many of them. Or, yeah, and then Gege. <laughs> but all the all the anime, like, oh, sorry, all the manga. I'm like, 
that sounds interesting, that sounds interesting, that sounds interesting. And all they did, what they did was just mention the title of the books. <laughs> Mostly in passing, yeah. <laughs> yep, yep. I'd like that was to very look... cute with with the librarian that they just started geeking out all of a sudden over Marcus. You've never read Renmo? I haven't. I know of it very well. Uh, okay. <laughs> I know what it's about, but I haven't read it. You're saying I like heard of, I, I'd like, heard of Fist of the wait. North Star because I think that's a pretty classic, isn't it? Can, can you wait just a what? second? We cut Alyssa off several times now. No, that's oh, okay. sorry. That's okay. Finish up. And I was no, no, just I'm asking, what was the one that you have read that you were saying? I was asked if um, she hasn't read Ranma when, um, Ranma and a half. Yeah, she and she said she has read something else a few times. Oh no, sorry. I said I've heard of um, Fist of the North Star. Is that mm. pretty classic? Is that yeah, an old it's one? very classic. Yes, yes. yeah, yeah. But then so is Ranma. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, that is very classic. <laughs> Ranma is not a um, a recent title. I like. I don't no. know when the book was published in Japan though. So no, that takes... was kind of the point of his interest. He's all of his interest ones that he was into were all older classic um, manga. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like. I, I get that. Uh, like he's in like that is, is classic manga, but also like. I, I don't know when the book is published in Japan, gathers enough success to be translated into English and come to us. That could take a while. Oh, right, a while. right. That, yeah, no, Not that's that long. Yes. I don't think it was that long ago. I think it's within the last five or six years. What, like it was translated maybe three years ago. Oh, no, Rama was... was definitely translated back when I was in Japan. No, 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 no this no, book. Sorry. No. Oh, this book, She's right, sorry. Suggesting this book could be 20 years old and therefore. Yeah, no, 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 it... I get what you're saying yeah. now. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, misunderstood where we were coming from with the date thing. Which book? Yeah. <laughs> I was checking. so I was noticing um the library assistant just also showed up in every story. She was yes. extremely helpful. And it seems crazy that you take five years of training. But I suppose if you're going to become a god in the middle of the library. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was because she was going the apprentice. Yeah, yeah, she, she was, was going, going the, route. yeah, she wasn't going through the um the course route. She was going through the apprenticeship route, and that was why it was going to take longer. So, whether that's fair or not, I don't know. She was so <laughs> useful. She was just kind and nice, and took care of everybody's kids. And mm. yeah, she's going to be a good librarian. Yep, and that's all See? I have to say about the book. And now I'm curious about when it was published, so I'm now doing my research. This, um, oh, the, this book? <laughs> Not this the English book. one, the Japanese one. Uh, it said, well, copyright is 2020, and it says translation yeah, was 2023. Oh, the... uh, interesting. Yeah. Right. Because yeah. I thought it was published in 2019. So that's Close why. Enough. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah, so pretty recent. I mean, then again, the the nineteen eighties were only twenty years ago, so <laughs> yeah. they just yeah, yeah. It's true. <laughs> we all agree with that. This is why <laughs> see, this is why I could actually picture his art was because as soon as he started referencing the particular types of books that he was the manga he was into, that's a particular style of artwork that that is versus like what was around even twenty years ago versus what's around now. Um, in in terms of what you get with your manga. So I was like, ah, oh, I can see exactly what he's doing in his head. And, yes, it is definitely yeah. not to everybody's taste nowadays. <laughs> That's right. And and he was 30 and talked about spending his formative, you know, young teen or late childhood at his uncle's uh, manga shop. So I imagine he was like 8 to 12 there and learned the styles of 22 years earlier kind of thing. Yeah. And because, like, I can yeah. actually see it, like, because I used to go to, like, one of those sorts of manga shops. It was actually called an internet cafe, but it was a manga shop as well. And, yeah. like, they would have all of those ones up on the shelf and that. And so that's actually how I saw things like Rama and stuff first. Couldn't read them because my Japanese wasn't good enough. But <laughs> I saw all of them up on the shelves and stuff like that. And so I can see exactly where he was and what he was doing. I'm sure those have been translated for years now. How long were you in Japan? When, what? Three years. How did you get there? I was um, went over when I finished my education degree um, as a teacher teaching English. So, no, oh, that's cool. Yeah, it was a it was a big step. I left home. I got my first full time job, and I went to a new country. 
<laughs> this is why she relates hey. to that for this first story so much. Yeah, yeah. Oh, the first story is just like so hard hitting for me. But um, but yeah, I, I always figure, you know, if you're gonna make all of those big steps, may as well do them all at once and just deal with the whole thing. Yeah, <laughs> water. Baby oh. steps, who needs them? <laughs> mm. All right, are we good guys? Yeah, I think so, yeah. All right. So anybody watching out there, if you got this, if you stuck with us this long, as always, well done. <laughs> and um, tell us how you're Karina. And, um, <laughs> um, and next month we are reading Tress of the Emerald Sea by Brandon Sanderson. Kirsten's pick. <laughs> yep. I broke the rule of not picking something you love. So sorry. Um, Oops. <laughs> We'll see how that goes. Bye. I've already learned that I I can expect that not everybody is on the same page as me yep. when it comes to these books. So I, I'm I'm going into it with um open eyes. I think I'm not going to be too <laughs> devastated. If you're honest with me. <laughs> I'm not going to agree with you, but I'm just 